Hi, everybody, and welcome to a an episode of Words, Images, and Worlds that I've been looking forward to, which is the chance to talk about mythology and comics and literacy with George O'Connor. George, thank you for jumping on, joining me this morning, and uh, having some morning coffee with me. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I hope it's a good dark blend for you, too, as well. It is. It is. There's some nice... I, I only take it with milk so there's that it's it's just right um so yeah yeah um so thanks for jumping on thanks for talking with me and thanks for the work that that you share as a literacy prof at one time i remember talking to a group of elementary teachers to be and pulling out your poseidon and showing nice. them that yeah yeah and saying hey imagine imagine the possibilities if this was in your classroom library that was a tough one to write um, in my process. Um, comics are words and pictures that come together to tell a story. And every cartoonist has a different method. But for me, the way it's always worked best is I kind of write and draw simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So the two can inform each other, which means that there's a lot that goes into drafts. And that book, I had to completely rewrite from scratch like three times until I was happy with it. Oh, wow. Wow. So Poseidon's always the one I look at and like, it's 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 one of my favorites if i may toot my own horn um but there was a lot that went into that one i'm always like i have a funny relationship with poseidon you know just, yeah. <laughs> like, it's a great book but boy i really worked hard for that one very very appropriate for the god of the sea just to figure out the the flow of that right there's a metaphor in there somewhere well, that's exactly sure. what it was um in so in my series i always strive to be very the, the idea behind Olympians and now as Guardians is to um, not necessarily write. I can't tell every story about the gods in Greek mythology. Mm. There's too many. So I try to find the ones that paint the perfect portrait of the god and in a very or goddess and in a very nuanced way. I don't want to give like the kind of I don't want to be like Hermes is the messenger god. Hera mm. is the jealous wife. I try to find more of the actual meaning behind them. And yeah, Poseidon was really inscrutable. I mm. think even to the Greeks, because you know they were a seafaring people, and one of their main gods is you know he goes from even for the gods he's tempestuous. You know he mm. goes. I always like to say he goes from crazy to zero in like two seconds. Wait, zero to crazy in two seconds. Mm. Oof. This is what happens when you do morning. Yeah, and back again. He's all <laughs> over the place. So like trying to get anything beyond the surface reading of him in that book, it took me a few tries until I finally was like, oh, I get this guy now. Yeah, yeah. So it was a labor of love. Definitely a labor of love, it sounds like. Yeah, I'd say every book in the series is. I'm a super fortunate person that I get to do these books. Like, not everybody gets to do what they love for a living. And my favorite stuff has always been mythology, drawing, mm -hmm telling stories and that's exactly what i do so you know every morning i wake up and i'm just looking at it like i'm actually conducting this interview from my drawing desk i get Love to look it. at what's on my drawing desk and be like oh boy i get to draw and tell stories today that's that's a good way to start the day that's a good way to it's, start it's not day. bad yeah were you a comics reader as a kid yeah um so I, I was drawing a lot before I was an avid comics reader, mm -hmm. but uh, both my parents definitely grew up with comics in the house. Like, and they would buy comics. They like they liked comics themselves. They buy comics for themselves, not not in like a crazy collector's mentality, but like just occasionally. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of Archie around the house. A lot of uh, my mom was a big fan of Superman. My dad was more of a Marvel guy. Um, and we had a lot of Conan. Uh, like Star Wars and Indiana Jones. Uh, he liked, I, I actually did too, the Hulk. We were like, ooh. So there's all this stuff. And then um, a little bit after I got into mythology, about in sixth grade, uh, I got into mythology around third grade, I should say. And around mm -hmm. like sixth or seventh grade, I was homesick from school one day. And my mom bought me an issue of The Mighty Thor. Mm -hmm. and it kind of brought it all together i was like oh it was during walt simonson's run if people know this too to get like kind of modularly geeky um he drew very heavily on norse mythology and i was in my more norse mythology phase at that point and i was like oh my god superhero comics are mythology and i've been looking at it that way ever since it just was like a perfect marriage of these two things i had loved 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I was actually gonna gonna go there too because I remember I had like a little set of they weren't from Clash of the Titans. They were just from some company that released them, like these little uh Greek mythology action figures. And they weren't posable, but they had Oh, I know things. the ones you're talking about. Like they were like yeah. like like a hard rubber sort of almost. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. I knew those. Yeah. I didn't have them. I found them a little bit later. I was like, oh. Yeah, I I had those. I got them through some mail order catalog or something. And I remember playing with them alongside my Marvel and, you know, like Secret Powers uh, or Secret Wars kind of like action figures and stuff. Um, and just <laughs> like it it worked in my head. I was like, yeah, they're, they're these super powered characters and they do these things and they tell these stories. Although the the Greek gods and uh, other mythologies are they, they can be a little darker than oh, some yeah. of the the marvel stuff but but it works maybe not modern things. marvel i feel like some of the comics that these days have gotten into it um that's the interesting thing about mythology is you know what we know as mythology now is what survives of these ancient cultures deepest held beliefs but they were they were this is like the stories that they told around the fireplace or the hearth so to speak Mm -hmm. um so these stories were very much crafted with entertainment value in mind they were explaining deeper mysteries of the world but that's not the bits that necessarily have survived to us like you know like they were told also for like entertainment yeah and so much of what we even know is a story like the very concepts of a story like comes from stuff that the ancient greeks wrote like you know in the odyssey it starts off in media reyes like it's like they've already invented all this like sophisticated storytelling stuff and it's coming out for the first time in mythology. And that's, as I've gotten older, um, mythology is something which you just heard I've loved like all my life. But now as an old man, like I go back and reread these stories for like the ninth time, 10th time, the millionth time. And it's stuff like that that really amazes me. It's not just the, you know, the cool cannibalism and, you know, explosion and stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the little bits of the quotidian, like the bits of daily life that are captured or realizing that, wow, like, look how sophisticated the storytelling is. And this is kind of close to the beginning of when we even have stories, at least that have gotten to us now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What what was it in third grade that tapped you into mythology? We, uh, uh, I'm glad you asked, because <clears throat> it was literally, um, there was a pro, I grew up in New York, um, in Long Island, and there was a program called STEPS. My teacher's name was Grace DeMille, and it was a prototype program that she created with a few other people where a few students, it was a pretty small group, it was like maybe one classroom from the whole school were pulled out. We tended to be, um, you know, for lack of a better term, the gifted students, but I also think of us as students who could have slipped through the cracks. Mm -hmm. We were put into this prototype program, which was very much based, <clears throat> pardon me, on project-based learning. Not just sitting in a classroom, like we sat in a circle, we did like journaling, we would learn, like we learned about like Rube Goldberg and stuff, like weird things that like really capture my interest. And we did a whole section on Greek mythology mm -hmm. we had to dress up as our favorite goddess or god, we gave oral reports, we did all these different projects based on it. And we used it as a way also of studying like European history and like, you know, like the stuff I'm talking about, like how story is made and all these different things that tied into it. But it really stuck with me indelibly like like school during that period was so exciting like coming in every day and me and all my friends talking about like which god was our favorite which one did this um i write about it a little bit in my book hermes because that's who i chose yeah and that book is even dedicated to my teacher mrs stimili because that was such a big moment and it does coincide with you know, there was other things happening in, in the zeitgeist, like that's about the time uh, Clash of the Titans came out mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So there was, it, it was like kind of a perfect storm for, for me as a little boy who liked to draw monsters, at, like finding muscle men to like be absolutely hooked on Greek mythology. Nice, nice. I love that. Love that story of a, a teacher. And man, that's just the kind of classroom it sounds like such a good place that's the kind of place that i want to craft that's amazing man it was it was cool and it was, it was so unusual and apparently ahead of its time and unfortunately uh i don't think it ever really got much beyond prototype stage <clears throat> huh. i think huh. it went for a few years with us and the school district i was in was very short-sighted and made budget like severe budget cuts 
and offered early retirement to a bunch of teachers, Mrs. Stimuli included. Wow. She's a famous daylily breeder now, if you look her up. She's she and her husband who also took early retirement, um, who's also in the district, breed daylilies and have all these different species. Oh species. Wow. It's probably not the day cultivars. I don't know. I'm trying to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but I clearly am not a botanist. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it all works. It all works. <laughs> So you you've tackled so many stories. I mean, you have several of the Greek stories that are out, uh, and now you have the Norse mythology world that you're starting to explore. Odin yeah. is twenty twenty four. Yeah, Odin's due in March. Yeah, Odin's completely done. Um, if you decide to keep this visual, I'll hold this up. I'm actually on my driver right now. Oh, is a wow. page. This is from Thor, book two. Love this it. is a little bit actually. Oh, this is the crafting of Mjolnir. Nice. See right there. So yeah, in the middle of uh, finishing up book two, the Norse mythology is only going to be four books because unfortunately, um, not a lot of Norse mythology survived. There's a lot of gotcha. uh, Greek mythology. There's enough Greek mythology I could do a book a year for the rest of my life and never run out. Um, but Norse mythology, unlike Olympians, it's going to be pretty much exhaustive. I'll do pretty much every story that survives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you do you think you'll tap back into the the Greek and Roman worlds? I think so. <laughs> I hope so. I really hope. Yeah, so. there's too I, much there is, to mine. <laughs> it really is, and it's I've missed those characters, and. Um, Again, to get modularly geeky, and any kids listening to this will know this because I've got so much mail about this. Um, I cheated when I did my 12 Olympians. First off, 12 is kind of an arbitrary number. Um, we like the number 12, but there's definitely more than 12. Mm -hmm. But book four was Hades. Now, everybody knows Hades. Hades is undoubtedly one of the great gods of Greek mythology, but he's not an Olympian because he never makes his residence on Olympus. So I cheat by having him there. That book in its development was a book on demeanor, the goddess of grain. And it really came down to marketing. We're like, my publisher very rightly pointed out, we're going to sell a lot more copies of Hades, Lord of the Dead than we are, you know, Demeter, goddess of grain. Mm -hmm. But, you know, all these, these people who read my books, especially the kids, they would write me all the time, be like, when are you doing Demeter's book? When are you doing Demeter's book? And I had this amazing uninterrupted run after supposedly wrapping the series of Dionysus, book 12, where at least once a day, I would get a request from someone being like, when are you doing Demeter's book? And it went for like over a year. It was amazing. And I'm like, I got to do this. And I finally realized, so I want to do a 13th secret Olympian book called The Mystery of Demeter, uh -huh, uh -huh. which ties in with her role in the mystery religions. And then, I mean, I have some plans. I would love just to, you know, at least periodically dip in and do Greek mythology books that don't tie in exactly with the 12 big guys with the olympians mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there was always a somewhat of a limiting factor if that could be said to be limiting about having to tie the stories in with one of the big olympian gods because there's a lot of myths out there that deal with minor goddesses or gods or heroes or monsters or whoever yeah so i have yeah. a whole bunch of ideas of like themed books like about olympian size but tying in with um some of the other characters who don't fall under the the moniker olympian god yeah, you you could have a whole the world of Olympians series. I love that idea. Yeah, that's actually not a bad title. <laughs> Feel free to use that. Feel free to use All right, that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that because uh, there are those those corner pockets of stories that sometimes people kind of go, "Oh, where did I hear that from?" And it's probably some ancient story that's been passed down. I mean, you look at the story of Odysseus. I yeah. mean, there there are like. 20 books there alone just within that one story um so it, yeah there's it's greek mythology if you were listening to this you've never returned to the original sources i recommend just dipping your toe in a little bit because if you are a fan of story you will find so much of what we as modern people classify as story has its roots in things that the greeks were writing down mm -hmm. it's pretty mm -hmm. amazing and if you're like me and you like to hunt around libraries and kind of explore like, you know, little avenues. And one of my favorite thing is to uncover the lesser known myths. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, everybody knows the abduction of Persephone, 
but there's so many different retellings of the abduction of Persephone, you know, like that's probably the most retold Greek myth back in the day. You'll find like weird little mentions, just like, just like what you said, Jason, just like little, like, what is this? And you could go down like the deepest of rabbit holes, uncovering the oddest stories or, or pe most intriguingly sometimes pieces of stories where something that it was something that was well known to people in the day and just through the luck of the draw that particular story didn't get back to us in its entirety but somebody makes an off <clears throat> pardon me someone makes an offhand reference to something you're like oh what was that what was that it's just i love it it's like it's like being a really boring version of indiana jones just sitting in the library all the time. <laughs> that That's the true life version of Indiana Jones. Yeah, yeah I should say the true life. <laughs> Seldom going out and punching Nazis, but you know. But it works. It works. Yeah, you, it's almost a choose your own adventure at that point of like, here, here are the story branches and here's where it goes, uh, depending on the time, the place, the culture. So yeah, um, so much there to explore. It's very cool. Like I said, I'm very fortunate what I get to do. This is, yeah. You know, if you'd gone to like little third grade George and been like, hey, this is what you're going to do when you grow up, he would have been like, right on, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. I was a very shy kid. I would have just nodded and smiled. <laughs> <laughs> So I have a, a process question and then we can yes. we can touch anything that uh, we haven't mentioned in the interview that you want to make sure to share. I actually I love seeing the the page up because one of the questions in my mind that's always been there with comics is the the thing of like word balloons and thought bubbles. So it's cool to see like you've got that in place on the page. Yeah. Um, right there alongside what you're working on. Um, so I'm just curious about like the time that it takes, because I think that's something that gets underestimated in comics. Oh yeah. Um, that happens a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. there's a lot of, like moving in kid lit circles. I meet a lot of illustrators of picture books or something who are excited about doing their first graphic novel. And I'm always like, it's a lot more work. Just, just know that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, they always do something beautiful and sometimes they go in and do others. And sometimes they're like, that's just not worth my time. There's a lot of, uh, we call it pencil mileage in comics. Yeah. Um, let me actually, since I was doing visuals, the way I mentioned already that I kind of write and draw simultaneously. Um, I don't have anything that would show you that would actually, and that would translate of my early drafts. But mm -hmm. if you open up any one of my books and look at a specific page, understand it's probably gone through about 12 rough sketches. Wow. Me just kind of, from the earliest bit of me just laying out the story, getting the pacing right, I make grids just to kind of keep the general pacing. If I'm mm -hmm. retelling one particular myth that I've earmarked about 12 pages for, and I'm like, you know, only in the setup, and I'm like six or seven pages in, I know I need to restart. A lot of it's like that. After I've got everything generally laid out, so this is an example of my roughs. Mm -hmm. This is what I work from. It's drawn in pencil. I've dropped in type and the approximate areas it's going to be in. And most of the beats of the story are there. This is actually the page you saw earlier where the creation of Mjolnir is happening. It's the same one here. Mm -hmm. From there, um, with, the, with the myth books, I do other books. And some of those, I've done other comics. Some of those I've drawn digitally because of there's an ease to that. But with um, as guardians and Olympians, I still like to draw with pa paper and pen. So I do. Uh, oh, hold on. This may not show up. Here's a page of just tight pencils. Yeah. With the word balloons in place. Maybe if I turn on this, will help. Mm -hmm. Looks good. So I work large, as you can see. Mm -hmm. I work quite large and shrink down, which is a secret to make it look better you know, when it's been reduced. Um, and the word bubbles are a super important component. Just like when I write these, I'm writing, like basically I should mention this, I always do. Um, if it's an idea I get across better as a drawing, I draw it. If it's an idea I get across better as words, I put in words. And when I put the comics, I'm combining the two. And sometimes the words complement the drawings and sometimes they work against it, but that's one of the things comics could do that other written forms can't. Mm -hmm. um, and the placement of word balloons is so key. It really controls, especially in the first reading, how your eye moves through the page. So I do that myself. Some people will let, like, you know, the editors do it or somebody like, I want the word bubbles to be placed exactly where I want. 
Mm -hmm. So after I get them laid in the pencils, then I use um, actually uh, pen and ink to do the finish drawings. Uh, if you're like a technique nerd out there, I use G nibs, which are a type of uh, pen nib that was, uh, it's from Japan. It's what manga artists use. Ah. Very versatile. Depending on how hard you push on it, you get like a great thickness of line. I have an entire array of them broken in at various degrees from least broken into most broken in, more broken in, the softer the line is. And I use that to ink everything. Nice. And you mentioned time. The layout stuff, <laughs> I could give you an accurate name, an accurate time for it, but I could lay out pencil wise. I could do like three or four pages a day. Mm -hmm. And then inking Olympians, I had a little bit cleaner art style. I was able to ink about two a pay, two a day pretty easily. As Guardians, I'm going for a more nitty gritty. So all the shadows are individually hatched. That I could probably only do about a page and a half before I just melt down. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried more. It's just like my brain really gets mushy after a bit. It's like if I draw another freaking line today, I'm gonna scream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that oh, too oh. technical? I don't know. I no, can never no, I like, love it. Sometimes people love that stuff. Some people are like, it's just a word match, like you know, washing over them. No, I, I love that. And I love the examples that you have ready made there. And I um, also love how your your process is so much on the page. I, I respect and enjoy digital art, but I love seeing kind of the, the process on the page too. Well, the um, thing about digital art that is nice is you have the control Z, the undo function. Mm -hmm. And depending on your personality, that could be a great boon or not. Like, I I used to be in a studio with a bunch of other comics artists. We unfortunately dissolved during the um the pandemic. But there were some people who work digitally who I'm like, you probably shouldn't. Because, like, every line that you would see on their finished work, they probably had drawn, like, you know, a dozen times. Because they would draw it, not perfect, control Z, not perfect, control Z. Mm -hmm. Um. I like drawing with pen and ink because I like there to be a lively sort of organic sense to my artwork. It's not perfect. It'll never be perfect. And there's something about like the actual pen and ink on paper. Like the pen actually cuts into the paper a little bit. Like you you don't have the perfect control over it because like it drags on the paper and I love it. And mm -hmm. it gives it kind of like a little bit of a rough hewn look, which I think really matches when I'm talking about, like, especially now, I'm talking about like these brutal Viking gods, you know. Mm -hmm. True. We also enough. worked for the Greek gods, who were kind of perfect and beautiful, but also did horrendous things. Yes, true, true. Yeah. <laughs> well, and uh, what you said there about working on each page like twelve times speaks so well to the process, because I know there are probably lots of authors out there and and illustrators who have work. But as you said, they do something and then ball it up and then do something and then ball it up. So yeah, um, just normalizing that process and revising, uh, but also the persistence of it is is so important too. Well, that's actually interesting because yeah, if a lot of us, there's so many people out there who are better artists than me and better writers. I I think, but one of the biggest tools to be a successful author cartoonist whatever you want to call me us um is is that willingness to go back and again and again and yeah and a stubbornness or persistence <laughs> and it, it's a particular mindset it's maybe it's something that can't be learned but i there's i think comics are a very difficult art form for people who are have a really strong perfectionist streak mm -hmm. and one of my editors once said this, and I think it's a great line. He said, reading a good comic is like reading a cartoonist's handwriting. You know, it's it's not an illustration that's just meant to be beautiful. It's meant to be words and pictures telling a story. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't over-render every single insignificant panel and make sure it's perfect. Because some of those panels, you want the reader to kind of skip over quickly. Right, right. And something I do very consciously is if it's a panel, I do want you to linger on a little bit more. If, there, if there's like I drop a bit of text that I want to like sit with the off the reader a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Or if it's something like um, I just want to show something being particularly arduous or something in the story, I'll add more detail on purpose to slow down the reader. 
Oh, smart. But then if it's a panel where I just want like you almost subliminal, like if it was a film, like if there's just a character looking in for a second, I'll draw that very quickly, a, a thin, narrow panel with like very few extra lines in it because you just you absorb it in faster. <laughs> I hope that's clear. Talking yeah. about a visual art form in a uh, only an audio sense is sometimes it's kind of like doing it with your arm tied behind your back. Right, right. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I've been reading comics since since I was seven, so it's it's cool to hear some of the process and the thoughtfulness of it, um, which again I think sometimes gets overlooked or underestimated. Um, so it's, it's been a a lovely conversation, and I've enjoyed talking with you so much. Did I miss anything from no. the interview that you want to make sure to share? I, I always like to give people space time to like share spaces where. Uh, they're particularly active. I know we're on a social media uh, multiverse right now of like all of these <laughs> new, <laughs> new things that are um, spreading out, but web spaces, upcoming events, anything like that that you want to share for listeners? Let's see. Um, so right now I'm on, if you if you follow me on Instagram where I'm the George O'Connor, that's the name. Um, I'm occasionally posting pictures behind the scenes, but I'm very much in a uh, a drawing grind. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm in the create. I'm you know I'm neck deep in the creation of Asgardians book two Thor, so I'm not posting a lot right now because I'm creating it. And also the first book in the series doesn't come out to March because of the insane lead time. So I don't want to post too much for a book that's you know over a year away. But uh, yeah, so Odin comes out in March. Mm -hmm. of 2 and 24 i believe thor comes out in november of 2024 in october of this year there is a book from abrams and marvel called marvel super stories where just because i'm doing all thor all the time i did a story about marvel comics version of thor for that oh, nice nice which cool. was really fun you know the comic that got me into comics essentially i got to do my own take on it and <clears throat> If you don't, there's such a gulf between the popular opinion of what Thor is in the world because of the Marvel character being so popular and the mythological version. And it's been really fun to kind of like strive that, you know, mm -hmm. like to do the Marvel version where he's like this Chris Hemsworth, tall, blonde, attractive guy. And then to go into the mythology version where he's got like glowing red eyes and bristly red hair and he's not probably very attractive and he's kind of a dummy but it's great the stories about thor are so fun so it's been uh it's been a lot of thor and uh, wait oh got excited thinking we were recording on thursday thursday but oh uh, that's yesterday. right yesterday i was yesterday when i screwed up the time it, it is all good it is all good <laughs> yeah where is friday named for freya is that a possibility they're not sure if it's freya or frig ah okay. and there's the whole thing to get into like there's the whole thing like people are not even sure if those are two separate goddesses that gives you an idea of how little norse mythology has survived wow. snorri sturluson definitely lists them as two separate goddesses but once you get outside of like the attestations of the prosetta it gets a little bit shadier whether or not they were viewed as two people i have oh. a whole theory about it which i get into in my odin book um i essentially depict them almost as like well, we live in a world where the multiverse is a concept people know. Right. I basically think of Freya as almost like the alter dimension version of Frigg. Ah, okay. All right. Interesting. Interesting. We that could have so gone geeky. for Woden's Day. No, I love it. I love it. Woden's Day? Yeah. It's good we day. could have done that. Yeah. Tears um, Day. And then 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 they just gave up in the Norse names after that. And we're like, you know what? Mun, soon and sun and moon. Those are still the same. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you so much for a great talk and I'm glad to share about this. Glad to share about your work and looking forward to all of the worlds uh, that you'll be exploring. So uh, lots there to tap into. And I hope educators, readers out there will um, be exploring along with you. Yeah, I hope so, too. Thank you so much for this opportunity to kind of bend your ear and your listeners ear with uh, my favorite topics. I apologize if I went on a little bit into the geeky realms, but that's who I am. So I can't really apologize for who I am. So. It's it's all good. It's all good. It <laughs> makes for, for really, really strong storytelling. So uh, I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you again. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right,